Brett. Hello, New Life East. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to be here. I th I've told several people, I think this is my first time ever preaching a second service. And so, yes! Are the roads slick out there or no? No. I'm, I'm seeing shaking heads. No, it's not. Um, so, Andrew, well, that was gracious of him. He introduced me and it was, yeah, he, um, Andrew's awesome. Andrew is, um, if you hadn't, if you can't tell already, I'm not Andrew. Andrew is like theological, existential James Bond. He's incredible. And um, he, he's breathtaking, goodness. And I am not. Um, I am also from the BBC. I am um, existential, theological Mr. Bean, um, is <laughs> who you have this week. And so that's, it's great, it's wonderful, we can all just breathe a sigh of relief at his funny facial expressions, and he's really like over the top, and he's like a, someone in high school called me when I was still figuring out like who I was, they said, you're a living, breathing cartoon character, and I'm like, okay, so you can all breathe a sigh of relief, that's who I am, we're all okay in this place, we're all safe, let's dive into Jonah chapter 4, but before we do that, let's pray, oh, Jesus. We love you, and we rest in your love. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you, even when we don't see it, you're working. Even when we don't feel it, you're working. That we, you've got us um, in your hands. Help us to believe that. We ask that you would open us up to that. And especially today, as we're engaging, like, kind of, maybe some really, like, tender wounds in some of us this morning. We ask that you would be breathing your life into us this morning. We ask and we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, world without end. Amen. Amen. So, uh, yeah, we're going to be in finishing up the book of Jonah this morning, which is Wonderful. Um, why don't you guys go stand for me? Go ahead and stand. I don't, we do this at Manitou, and we're going to just gonna, you know, stir the pot a little bit. Go ahead and stand. Hear the word of the Lord this morning from Jonah. Uh, the end of Jonah. We'll start in chapter 3, verse 10. God saw what they were doing, the Ninevites, um, that they had ceased their evil behavior. So God stopped planning to destroy them, and he didn't do it. But Jonah thought this was utterly wrong and became angry. He prayed to Yahweh, Come on, Yahweh! Wasn't this precisely my point when I was back in my own land? This is why I fled to Tarshish earlier. I know that you are a merciful and compassionate God, very patient, full of faithful love, and willing not to destroy. At this point, Yahweh, you may as well take my life from me because it would be better for me to die than to live. Yahweh responded, is your anger a good thing? But Jonah went out from the city and sat down east of the city. There he made himself a hut and sat under it in the shade to see what would happen to the city. And Yahweh God provided a shrub, and it grew up over Jonah, providing shade for his head and saving him from his misery. Jonah was very happy about the shrub, but God provided a worm the next day at dawn, and it attacked the shrub so that it died. Then, as the sun rose, God provided a dry east wind. And the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint. He begged that he might die, saying, It's better for me to die than to live. God said to Jonah, Is your anger about the shrub a good thing? 
Jonah said, yes, my anger is good, even to the point of death. But Yahweh said, you pitied the shrub for which you didn't work and which you didn't raise. It grew up in a night and perished in a night. Yet for my part, can't I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who can't tell their right hand from their left? and also many animals. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. You guys can be seated. And no, you didn't miss anything. Your Bible, there's not a misprint in your Bible. Your phone isn't like glitching, up, like the Bible app isn't glitching up on your phone. Like that's the way the book ends. It just ends like that with a question hanging out there from God. God asks, can't I pity Nineveh, Jonah? Can't I? It's, it's like a weird end to the story. Let's be honest. It's been a weird story to begin with. It's been a weird story from the get-go, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4. It's been weird the whole time. The prophet of God has been running from God, chapter 1. And then we had like the greatest hits from the Psalms, sung from the gut of a fish in chapter 2. And then five words in Hebrew, a five-word sermon causes a repentance like stampede in chapter 3 three like like everybody oh man he just said five words it's been weird and so I guess it would be weirder in this story if it had like a conventional if it like and then Jonah and the Ninevites lived happily ever after that that would be that might be a weirder ending because it's been a weird story it would be weird if it had a normal ending that would be a a normal neat and tidy kind it would be perfectly comfortable and it would be perfectly forgettable, <laughs> honestly, because the way this ends, this is, this is where we, um, so many of us are familiar with cartoon Veggie Tales Jonah, uh, or children's books Jonah, and they, a lot of them just cut out chapter four. And so a lot of us never graduate from cartoon Bible stories to actually reading and thinking about the Bible. And so like, and this is true for even culture at large, who's like, thinking about Jonah, knows vaguely about Jonah, and it's like, why is everybody, why through the centuries have they found this compelling? Have you read it? They're like the actual text. It's terribly compelling. It's terribly haunting. This is the, it's a weird ending to the story. We, um, I, before we, just a precursor, I think Andrew's already touched, I know Andrew's already touched on this, but we should never forget that Jonah is not um, in any kind of... Jonah's situated in the heart of a book called the Book of the Twelve. It's what a lot of times we call the minor prophets. But Jonah is prophetic literature. That's what this haunting, compelling, not a cartoonish story is. Is It is explicitly, it comes after the book of Obadiah this, on the scroll of the twelve and right before the, the words of the prophet Micah. It is a work explicitly of prophecy. And what this story, this narrative of Jonah is meant to do, it is a story that is meant to breathe God's very life into us. It's not meant to be just like analyzed or cartoonified or like, oh, that's an amusing story. No, this story is meant to get under our skin. It's meant to be inhaled. It's meant to come into us. It's meant to hit our bloodstream. It's meant to like get into our actions and change us. Nowhere do we see that more than the last chapter of Jonah, the part that gets cut out a lot of times from the story. It's the prophetic edge to the book of Jonah. It's the very heart of it is what we're touching here today. The book ends with a hanging question. Can't I pity Nineveh, those 12, 10,000 people, these animals, can I not pity them, Jonah? 
The book began with Yahweh, of course, wanting Jonah to deliver a message to these people. Hey, Jonah, why don't you um, arise and go to Nineveh? Yeah, to those people that you don't like. Yeah, I got that. To those people that don't look like you, act like you, talk like you, vote like you. Those people who are a threat to your national security, to your way of life. I know you don't like them. Yes, to the capital of the Assyrian Empire, to the center, uh, the the capital, Nineveh, the center of state-sponsored terrorism and brutality and cruelty. Arise, Jonah, and go. I want you to deliver a message for me. And and then there's a lot. The the most memorable part of the book, of course, is Jonah not doing that and getting swallowed by uh, the great fish. But when Jonah finally does deliver this five-word sermon to Nineveh, the city is transformed. It is. It, re- it truly is. It's overturned. It's turned upside down. It's transformed from the inside out. The city of Nineveh, from king to commoners to, <laughs> to even the cattle. You guys caught that last week. It's absurd. It's silly. It's over the top. It, it really is Saturday Night Live or Monty Python kind of silly. The cattle are dressed in sackcloth and ashes. All of them are repenting. They are turning from their it says in verse 10, what we re- the beginning of what we read today, they, re- they turn from their ra'ah, from their ra'ah, from their evil, from their violence, from their, th- that word ra'ah, it, it's badness. It's really, it's kind of the, the bulky, clumsy way of translating it, but it, we need to translate it that way for just a second. They turn from their badness, and God sees this in chapter 3, verse 10, and so God halts his plan to bring ra'ah on them, to bring badness on them, to bring disaster on, it's the same word. It's used twice there at the end of chapter three. Badness. They turn from their ra'ah, from their badness, and then God turns from his ra'ah, from the badness that he, the disaster he's going to bring on them. But then when we arrive here at chapter four, at the prophetic edge of the book of Jonah, suddenly, Like, this is the place where we're supposed to inhale, where it's supposed to hit our bloodstream, and this is what's happening here. It says the Ninevites stop their badness, and God won't bring badness on them. And then Jonah sees all of this, verse 1 of chapter 4, and Jonah sees the turning of badness, and God not bringing badness, and he thinks this is bad, bad. Big bad is literally what it says. It is vayara ra'a gadola. It is an evil, a great evil to Jonah. It's bad, big bad. And he's mad about it. Jonah is angry about this. The, 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 the literal word for angry in Hebrew, it's the word hot. Uh, Like the kettle would get angry when it's cooking tea. It'll get hot. It'll start boiling. It'll start percolating like it's it's hot to the top. Angry here when it's saying this about Jonah, It like the picture, it's like um, Donald Duck is what the picture, you know, Donald Duck, like the anvil, anvils don't fall on Donald Duck. That's Disney. They don't, on on, uh, Daffy Duck, I don't know. But Donald is getting angry. Angry, and then the red starts rising on his face, and there's like steam's coming out of his ears. And somebody, like somebody's hungry for breakfast, I suppose, like cracks the egg and puts it on his forehead, and it's like, oh, an omelet! This is delicious. Like that's the image of what's going on with Jonah right here. He's cooking, he's fuming, he's sizzling. God is letting off those those Ninevites. And he, God is not going to let loose on the Ninevites like I think he should. And so Jonah lets loose on God is what happens here at the beginning of the chapter. He's like, come on, Yahweh. We read it. Wasn't this precisely my point when I was back in my own land? Apparently, this is how we should 
the Bible's genius meditation literature. And so this is like us, like learning, oh, this is how I'm supposed to be reading the rest of the story. This is why he was running. This is actually behind all of him in chapter two with the greatest hits of the Psalms. I knew this already. This is why I was going to Tarshish. I knew that you were merciful. I knew you were compassionate. And by the way, right here, this is actually the words that he's using are, um, they're, they're really important words. This is actually the central covenant identity of Yahweh that was revealed to Moses in the cleft of the rock in Exodus 34 is what he's quoting right here. It's really, I knew your identity, Yahweh. I knew who you would revealed yourself to be, covenant God. You are merciful you're compassionate, you're patient, you're full of faithful love, you are, you will to not destroy. That's your will, is to not destroy. And at this point, Yahweh, I hate it all because of them. It's going out to them now. And I would rather you take my life from me. Look, the Verse three right here at the end of his speech, it says something literally like, my death is more good than my life. It's more good, and this is, the, this is the first time good has shown up right here in this cluster of verses. It's been ra ra ra-ah, 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 and now it's tov. Something is good, and it's my death. Ugh, I just, I hate it. In verses two and three, Jonah basically says, I knew you, God. I knew you, covenant God of Israel. You're a dirty, rotten forgiver. I hate you. You're not going to bring badness on them. This is bad, big, bad, evil, a great evil. Your mercy is ra'ah. Your, your conti- my continuing to live is ra'ah. And I know what is good. I know, in my eyes, I know what is good, and it would be my death. I would rather die than keep living in the way things are. He says all of this in 39 words in Hebrew. 39 words. Great trivia, Brett. <laughs> no, that's, no, I'm just kidding. There's actually more to it than that. Um, we know that we're arriving at the heart of the book because he says this in 39 words. And then at the end of the book, God finally replies to him, doesn't he? God finally replies that bit about Uh, 120,000 people, animals, that sort of stuff. He replies to him in verses 10 and 11. And do you know how many words God replies to Jonah in? Well, it's precisely 39 words. The Bible's genius, meditation literature. It's not a cartoon. It's, it's, It's really smart. And the author wants us to connect these two things, wants us to connect the profundity of Jonah's anger and complaint and then have us reckon with what God is saying to Jonah. That's what he's wanting us to do. And between the 39 words of Jonah and the 39 words of God, you have a really bizarre, strange story about a... Uh, uh, a plant. <laughs> the King James called it a gourd. Nobody really knows what it is. It's a kikayon is what it is. It's, a, it's a, some sort of leafy vine, a, a tree, a, a shrubbery is <laughs> what it's called here in uh, the Common English Bible. And I keep saying to people, I told people at Manna too, Jonah is the, most li- is the book of the Bible most like SNL or Monty Python. And this, I feel totally vindicated and validated by the Common English Bible because here is the scene with the shrubbery. We have the shrubbery here. If you haven't seen, um, if you haven't seen King Arthur according to Monty Python, please go see it. Um, uh, God is going to respond to him after the shrubbery. But here, as Jonah's complaining, right on the tail end of Jonah's 39 words of complaint, he asks Jonah the question in miniature. A microcosm question. He says, is your anger a good thing? Is it good? Is it a good thing? Jonah is full of, it's written in um, like a poetic kind of prose. It's very tightly written. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can unpack the, or unfold the meaning of it. That question, you could say it a, a couple of different ways. You could do it way more than this. But is it good that you're angry? 
Is it good that you're angry, Jonah? Does it please you that you are angry? Are you angry about the right things, Jonah? Is it worthwhile what you are angry about? Is your anger good to you? Is it good to you? And Jonah, <laughs> poor, poor Jonah at this point, he gives no answer to God. He Instead, it says, verse 5, that he marches out of the city. We should just pause right here for a second because apparently Jonah's entire 39-word complaint, he's been yelling to the sky in the middle of a revival. He's been in the city the whole time. It's like raise a hallelujah is happening around him. And he's like, you see all these people? And that guy over there, Frank over there, I hate him. I don't want him to be raising a hallelujah, God, which is a bit awkward if you're Frank the Ninevite. You know what I mean? Because Frank the Ninevite's like, what did I ever do to him? You know, this is awkward. Um, but this is the moment right here as Jonah's, he's been asked this question, is it good? Is it worthwhile what you're angry about? And Jonah's marching out. It says he's marching east of the city, verse 5, which is not insignificant. He's marching east of the city. We need to be really sympathetic to Jonah right here. We, he's the bit of the, the buffoon. He's a bit of the, bit of the anti-hero in um, the entire book of Jonah. Um, but Jonah's anger, it is like all of our anger. And it feels really worthwhile. We need to camp out here for just, just a second. Yes, he's angry. And if you want an answer to those questions of whether it's worthwhile or right, yes, it's right that he's angry. It is. It's worth, he, it does please him to be angry because he's angry about the right things. He's angry. He, he is on the side of good is what he is. The Assyrians, they're barbarians. They're objectively terrible. They have mounds of skulls. They hang people's skin up. They, they're trained in terror and they are built, they are bent on world domination. They are the Nazis of the ancient world. That is true. The Ninevites are Nazis. And not, like, you Nazis are the one group of people that get shot by Indiana Jones and none of us blink twice, none of us think twice about it. We're like, yeah, the Nazis got killed. It's the one, am I right? You can kill them with impunity. That's fine. It, what, so, and so the question like that Frank the Ninevite's asking is a little absurd. Like, what did you ever do to him, Jonah? Frank, this is a little awkward. You're a Nazi. You know that, right? Jonah doesn't want the Ninevites off the hook for all the evil that they have done, for all the atrocities that they have committed, all the cities they have pillaged, all the men that they have killed, all the women that they have raped, all the babies that they have butchered. Real life! All the pain they have caused, and now the idea that they're, that they're stopping they're stopping from this. They're no longer Nazis. The idea that they would turn from their badness and that God's badness would not overtake them. The badness that God could bring, the disaster, the idea that God would show them mercy. This is horrible. Yes, it's good that I'm angry. God rain down fire on them. Burn the city. Burn them to hell. They deserve it. They're Nazis. That's what's going on with Jonah here. That, we should be profoundly sympathetic to him. And so he marches out of Nineveh. And he sits down east of the city to the east. It's not insignificant, the Bible's genius meditation literature, because it's giving us a clue, even in that detail. It's telling us something about Jonah and something about his anger. By the time Jonah gets recorded and passed down in the scroll of the 12, in the book of the 12, that point on the compass, east, east has become profoundly symbolic, especially as the Bible begins. East 
is how in Genesis 3 you leave Eden. You leave Eden to the east. East is the direction that Cain heads, we're told, covered in his brother's blood in Genesis 4. East is where the Tower of Babylon, the Tower of Babel, gets built in Genesis 11. We're explicitly told it's in the east. Oh, and by the way, Lot head. Lot and Abraham, Abraham's nephew, he heads to the east. And you know what he finds there? Sodom and Gomorrah, the great city that gets destroyed by fire. <laughs> That's Genesis 13, and it is in the east. And this is maybe the clincher of it. Maybe those are all coincidental. Until you read the boring books of Leviticus, and you start hearing the way that God is directing people to build the tabernacle and later the temple Every bit of the directions that are like, oh, boring, I don't want to just skim over that. It's genius. Because do you know how the tabernacle and temple are constructed? As you walk into the tabernacle, back towards God's presence, back into Eden, you're explicitly heading west. That's the direction. Yeah, that's the way it's always been. When you're camping out in the wilderness, you always orient it this way because you're always the holy of holies, back into God's presence, back into the way that things are supposed to be. That is to the west. And so you've got to leave the east and you've got to come home to God, come back to God. And so Jonah, it's like the narrative embedded in the genius narrative. It's not a cartoon. It's genius literature. Jonah, I know you feel justified in your anger. I know, I know they're horrible. I know they're Nazis. But Jonah, you're marching the wrong direction. Jonah sits down. <laughs> he makes himself, it says, some kind of hut. That's what it says. He, uh, a booth, a sukkah is what he makes. And he, it's like he's camped out east of the city. And he's keeping tabs on their Facebook profile. Not, not, that any, not that anyone in the room knows. Uh, I'll just be the vulnerable one. But like, not that anyone in the, room, in the room knows what it's like to hate someone from a distance and to like watch the refresh. I want to see what happens to them. They're, he's like watching their pr Facebook profile. It's an uncomfortable place to be for, I'll just tell you, because none of you have ever done it. It's an uncomfortable place to be. He's literally, it says, he's burning, egg sizzling on his head, burning with anger. And the sun, it says, isn't helping with the heat, is it? It's like the sun, he's hot already, and then the sun is beating down on him. And so God provides. God's merciful. God gives us, just to let you know, God always gives us what we need. And God provides for him, provides a, sh that darn shrubbery <laughs> is what is provided here, and saves him from his misery is what it says, from his ra'ah. He's got this miserable circumstance, his ra'ah. He gets saved from the badness of his situation. This shade, apparently, is better than the makeshift hut that he put together, and it's, it's, it's the only time we see joyful Jonah in the book. Just as a side note, it's the only time that Jonah's happy. He, in his selfishness, has everything that he wants. He's finally comfortable. But there's no lasting happiness in the East. <laughs> it's, it's, and so what happens is it's, it's, it's surreal, isn't it? It's weird. It's strange. But like spring, the, the bush sprung up overnight in verse 10, and then it gets destroyed just as quick because God provides it says, God provides a grub, a worm, a maggot, something. <laughs> he provides something and it gets eaten. And God had provided that darn shrubbery and now he provides that darn worm. And then God provides one more time in the book of Jonah. He provides, verse 8, a scorching. It says dry in the common English Bible right here, but it's like a dry, uh, a scorching. It's, some, it's like the word, it's related to plowing the soil is the word here. It's like something that cuts straight through. It's this east wind that apparently tears down his hut. And Jonah now, because of the provision of God, God has provided once, twice, 
three times, and now, thanks to the provision of God, Jonah is hotter and angrier, boiling, more sizzling than ever, and he blurts out one more time. He says, my death is more good than my life. It's like, jo- it's like God is providing a crisis. <laughs> it's like sometimes God... In my life, sometimes that's what we need. (laughs) He provides Jonah with a crisis. Jonah has this death wish. He's hitting refresh on the Facebook profile. He's just camped out. He's gotten really comfortable in the east, in the hellish heat. And God has to provide and provide and and to strip away his comfort and then to get him into like this crisis and then finally get him to deal with his anger and so God asks him the same question it was in miniature before and now it's blown up into the macro he says is it good that you're angry about the plant I mean about the plant, let's just start there. Jonah, Jonah's a little bit of a melodramatic. Uh, yes, my anger is good. It is good that I'm angry to the point of death. And then God gets his 39 words. And he basically says, well, you care about this plant. You think it's horrible that you've lost this plant. But wouldn't it be horrible if I lost this city? I mean, Jonah, I know they're Nazis, but they're not always going to be. Shouldn't I care for them? And the question just like hangs there. (laughs) It like goes to black, black screen, credits roll, and we're all sitting in the movie theater like, what did we just watch? What, What do we do with this? The book of Jonah ends with a cliffhanger. It ends, actually, uh, an analogy, it ends like Jesus' parable about the prodigal son. It ends with that sort of cliffhanger. And so it's just like hanging there, the question of like, what happens to the older brother? The father spoke. This son of mine was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. And the question is, well, what, what, what happens? What's the older brother do? Does the older brother come in and join the party? He joined the party. It's not a comfortable ending in the book of Jonah. It sure as heck isn't a forgettable ending, unless you're making a, car- a cartoon about it, and then you conveniently forget about it. Uh, it's, it's an impossibly difficult ending um, that haunts us, and so we could say it this way. It's an ending that says God loves the villains of our story. God loves the villains of our story. That's the the prophetic edge of the book of Jonah. That's what we're invited to inhale. God loves those people we hate. He loves them. Not only that, he likes them. He's rooting for them. He's at work in their lives. He will have them. He is after them as much as he's after us. He loves them, the villains. He loves the, vil- the people that we are not just feel justified in hating, but like we actually are justified in, in hating. They're Nazis. They're barbaric. They're rude. They're condescending. Oh, I despise them, that group of people, that per she tore up the state of the union. He is tearing apart the presidency, don't you see? He's a corrupt communist. Well, she's a heartless capitalist. Or maybe it's a little closer to home than all that, um, though that is close in all of our hearts, the tribalism that infects our culture that we all need to repent of. Perhaps it's closer to home, and I don't want to make light of this. She betrayed me. He abused me. They hurt me. They, they knew what they were doing the whole time. And the family, the family's the one that suffers. And this ending of Jonah haunts us. God loves them. He loves them. He loves them. 
It says God loves the villains of our story, but thank God he loves the villains of the story because I'm the villain in someone else's story. The way they tell the story, I'm the one that did it all. <laughs> this isn't like abstract. I can face his names in me. I know. They, it's really good news. <laughs> like, he loves the villains, and I'm the villain a lot of times. When, let's be clear. When we are hurt, like legitimately, actually, desperately hurt, it's really easy for us to fall into the trap that Jonah's in east of the city. We, we want God to be the godfather. <laughs> That's what we really want. We want to waltz into God's mahogany-laced office, you know, and we want to tell him about our pain, our plight, our suffering, and then we want him to, like, send some angel goons out to bust a few kneecaps of, of our Ninevites, you know what I mean? Could you go just hurt them? But sooner or later, if God kept on smashing kneecaps of everybody, if God gave just desserts to everybody, if God rained down fire and burned to hell every villain in everybody's story, there'd be no one left. This isn't to say that Mr. Hitler and Mr. Rogers are the same. I'm, it's not to say that. Of course not. It's not to say. They're not the same, obviously. Mr. Rogers did not hurt people on the same scale that Mr. Hitler did, but Mr. Rogers hurt people. He was the villain in someone's story. The point is, we all hurt each other. We, we all could throw stones, and somehow, in the midst of all of this, we're all Jonah, thinking that God should take my side more than anyone else's. We want God to be like our secret weapon, like a, like a men in black, like big old gun that we can just pull out and inflict fiery vengeance on like our enemies. But notice, who's the only one in this story who feels like they're on fire? It's Jonah. It's Jonah. It's the covenant people of God. It's not the Nazis. It's the, it's the prophet. And I think that's because um, a death wish is a boomerang. It's a boomerang. God wants, or not God, Jonah wants them dead. He, want, he hates them. He's so angry at them. He wants them dead to such a degree that it's circled back on him. <laughs> and then all you hear him talking about now is, I wish I was dead. I'm so angry. And I've just like thrown this thing out. It's like come back around. And it's it. When we hold on to anger, anger is not like a sin. There are good things to be angry about <laughs> in the world. But when we, like, sit in it, we, when we set up a hut and camp out in it, when we, like, let anger, we open the gates and we let it seep down into our bones, into our soul, and we start, like, kind of nurturing it and cultivating it. And yes, I'm right to be angry. And yes, it pleases me. At that point, anger starts becoming hatred. It starts becoming contempt. It starts becoming, yes, it's good that I'm angry, and yes, I wish they were dead. This world would be better without them. And the person burning in hell is us. That's the person who's hellishly burning. We could say it this way. If God is love, then hatred is hell. It's the opposite of God. If God is love, hatred is hell, and we're invited out of the heat. You're invited out of the heat. This is the part where, like, we've all been wounded, and I don't know who I'm talking to in here, but, like, some of you have been wounded, like, deeply, impossibly, unthinkably. And I'm here to tell you that what they did matters. Like, you were abused, you were betrayed, they sexually violated you, you were lied to. 
Like, it, it matters. It matters to you, and it matters to God. It desperately matters. We need justice in this world, but like our hunger for justice often lands us east of the city burning like hell. It's corrupted. Our anger, the good, there's good news for all of us who have been desperately wounded today. Our anger doesn't have to curdle like milk. It doesn't have to like congeal into contempt or hate. Um, and here, um, we're approaching like the very heart of the gospel here. We're approaching like the, the, the sacred mystery of the Christian faith because as Christians, we understand that God deals with every injustice, everything wrong, all those things that significantly, they matter desperately. Every darkness and injustice and, and brutality and horror, God has dealt with it. And he's dealt with it by bearing it by entering into it, by shouldering it, by letting it pierce him, himself. He is, there is nothing, there is no experience that you have experienced. There is no crime. There is no loneliness. There is no, like, breakdown. There is no tragedy. There is no mental illness that God himself has not entered into himself and made his own. I will be in this with you and for you and carry you out the other side. That is, the, that is central to the Christian understanding of reality. That's the cross. And what do we see on the cross? We should just name it. What we see on the cross is we see God crucified seeking the good of the people killing him. God crucified seeks the good of his killers. Even in the midst of his agony, God the Son is praying forgiveness over his enemies. And that's because God is inexhaustible love. He's inexhaustible, that is, he's inexhaustible love. He loves, he lo that's who he is. That's what God is like. And when we see the Son of God praying, Father, forgive them on the cross, we are seeing the deepest power of the universe. We're seeing the engine room. We're seeing the deepest joy of creation, the very fabric of reality. We're seeing it on full display. God is not a secret weapon to hurt other people with. God isn't the Godfather to break the knees of our Ninevites. God is a good, good Father. That is who he is. He loves inexhaustively and not just us. Not just us. He is desperately concerned about all the ways that you have been hurt. More concerned about it than you are. And he's desperately concerned that he would bring all of his wayward children back to him. He's interested in saving and rescuing and transforming and redeeming in restoring everyone, including, including the Ninevites. And so in Jesus, in the cross, God, this is what we trust. This is what I, all my betrayals and the things that I've been wounded by that doesn't, that pale in comparison to some of yours, but I bring them to God on the cross where God has neutralized evil and he's made a path for us. It's a path out of hate. He's made a path through hate. That's where we all get stuck. Our, our longing for justice lands us in the swamp of hatred. And he's like, here's a path through. Because of Jesus, none of us have to forever be defined by what other people have done to us or by what you've done to other people. Something new is possible. Something new is possible. It, we, can, we can get out of the scorching east wind. It's the gospel. We can head west. 
we can start going a different direction. We can start going home. We can release. We can forgive. We can hope. We can have new life. We can inhale. Ultimately, this is the Christian hope. I don't, we, we can practice living toward a world where our villains become our friends. That's the kingdom of God. That's the scandal of the gospel, and I don't even know how to say it to some of you. And to myself, I don't even know. Mo, we can't even imagine this. But if we are following Jesus, this is where Jesus beckons us. This is where we have to go. This is, he, fa- he fixes our eyes westward. I don't, I'm terrible with cardinal direction, so just pretend that's west. Is it? I don't know. It is? Yes! Yes, he fixes our eyes westward. And he says, imagine going that way villains becoming friends and he wants us to ache for it to dream about it even when circumstances don't allow it even when it's like ah oh, there is not a person on the planet that god is not crazy about that god does not love there's not a person who has ever lived that god does not claim as his own god loves your ex and he loves the bully, and he loves your boss, which sometimes are the same thing, (laughs) and he loves the Ninevites, and he loves the people on the other side of the political aisle, and he, he loves the person that we hate. And if we are cultivating hatred towards them, then we are not following Jesus. We are not we, we may not love the villain yet. We may not love it yet. But if we're serious about following Jesus, it's our destiny to love the villain. That's where God is taking us. God is destined us to be fully and forever alive like God. To be fully and forever loving like God, even towards our enemies It's what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. And so one day, I don't know how, I don't know how, but this is like the good news of the gospel and the challenge of the gospel. One day, this is what Jesus compels me to believe. One day, they won't be the villain anymore. One day, they won't be our enemies anymore. The truth that I'm haunted with is, book of Jonah closes as the credits start to roll is that resurrection life, it eventually involves a party with the Ninevites. It eventually involves a party with your Ninevites. I'm haunted by that. And it fills me with such hope. It fills me with such hope because I'm not unlike you. I've got people in my life that I've got their phone number in my phone, and I can't call them, and I can't make the relationship right. I don't, it's too complex. It's like this web of, how do you untangle it? I've got broken relationships that I don't know how to make right to this side of the New Jerusalem. But the deepest ache of my heart is that they would be made right. Lock me in a room for a million years with that person until I can open myself up to them and they can open themselves up to me and we can understand each other and love each other and call each other friends. That would not be hell to me. That would be heaven. The reconciliation of relationships, of all things. And so this morning... That's what we're invited to hunger for, the kind of heart that we're invited to to pursue, to ask God for, one that wants to party with our Ninevites. We ache for it. The first step as um, as we're coming to the table this morning, the first step to all of this is wanting a heart that wants out of hell, the hell of anger, the hell of hatred. Oh, the hellish reality of sitting outside the Father's house while there's a party going on. And the question looms before us, will you join the party? Will you join the party? This morning, um, for all of us, but for some of you, like the Spirit's just like, pff, pff, pff. Spirit wants to like empty you of hell. 
of the heat, the anger. The, ugh, he wants to empty you of the hatred and begin filling you with the life of heaven, with love. And it's going to be a process. It's not going to be a one and done thing, but he wants to invite you to open it up and drain the infection and let love in. The Spirit wants to fill you with his life, with peace, with love, with hope, with new life. The Spirit wants you to be defined not by what you've done to other people or what they've done to you. The Spirit wants to define you by inexhaustible love. You are loved. You are loved. You are loved. You are loved. 